Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to come and give a seminar. Thank you, Jim, for um, in inviting, and thank you, Zenna, for the nice introduction. And so I've started out with a picture of a chessboard because I think this is a nice analogy for this kind of battle between wheat resistance and Puccinia graminis virulence. And in this talk, I'm going to talk about four different things in these four sections. I'm going to start off with an introduction to wheat stem rust and UG99, and then go into some things that you may not know about stem rust resistance and kind of give a, a 2017 update or scoreboard um, about what's going on. And then I'm going to talk about strategies for 2017 and beyond. This is really where I'm going to get into the research that's going on in our lab right now. And then end with some take home messages. And so starting off with this introduction to wheat stem rust in UG99. This map shows where wheat is grown in the United States and the areas that are red are often where wheat is grown every single year in the same field, and then orange maybe every other year, yellow occasionally wheat is grown. A couple things I want you to take away from this map are that wheat is grown all around the United States, but there are really um, three major areas um, here. And so in those three areas are actually different market classes of wheat. And so each of these dots also represent where wheat is grown, but you see that the dots are different colors and the colors correspond to these different market classes. And so these are actually different types of varieties of wheat, you know, and so durum wheat is actually a different species than the other kinds. And in many of these um, varieties, there's not very much <coughs> overlap genetically um, between them. So, you know, the hard red spring wheat varieties are, are actually quite very different from the soft red winter wheat varieties. And so when we talk about wheat in the United States, there's really, um, it's a little bit more complex than you might um, think initially. So this talk is about stem rust. So let's, let's go back in time a little bit to 1935, where you can see the results of a stem rust epidemic. And um, you can see this is the percent loss across the entire state um, of the wheat crop that was lost to stem rust. And so in North Dakota and Minnesota, over 50% of the wheat crop was lost. And this is kind of significant because not only is it really severe in this one area, it's really wiping out you know, a whole market class of wheat pretty much. So stem rust can be very devastating when you get an epidemic. And in, in the United States historically, there were some pretty big epidemics. And this chart shows the percent loss in the U.S. wheat crop over time. And so starting in 1918, going all the way up to 2008, and then on the y-axis, the percent of the entire wheat crop that was lost. So here you see in 1935, about 25% of the whole U.S. wheat crop was lost. So you can see that there were sporadic epidemics, but starting around you know, 1962, there have not been any epidemics in the United States. So let's you know, go into a little bit more about what that really means. Now scientists found out early on that Puccinia graminis has this complex life cycle. And so the epidemics are caused by Puccinia graminis, the fungus, producing these spores, iridinio spores, that fly in the air and reinfect wheat. And so you get this rapid multiplication of these spores that can blow across the plains and cause these big epidemics. But in addition to that, there's also this sexual cycle that goes through infection of the alternate host barberry. And so when you have sexual uh, reproduction of Puccinia graminis, you can actually get uh, a diversity of races. And so it was decided it would be very important to eradicate barberry from the wheat growing regions of the United States. And so there was this massive US government program to actually eliminate barberry um, throughout especially the northern United States. And, and each of these black dots is actually a rural property where barberry was eradicated. So you can see this was quite an extensive program. So this was actually very successful uh, in, in getting rid of the alternate host. But even after most of the barberry eradication took place, we still had some pretty big epidemics. So what was going on there? You know, we got rid of the alternate host, but we still have epidemics. Well, there was a couple of races that emerged 
And so in 1935, it was really race 56, that we call MCCFC, that the race or a strain of the pathogen that caused the epidemic. And then in the 1950s, there was a different race. And so what was really going on is that there were a number of wheat varieties that were grown across the Great Plains, and those wheat varieties had different stem rust resistance genes. Now these races or strains of the pathogen were actually adapted to these varieties that were deployed, and the races broke those resistance genes down, causing an epidemic. And then new varieties came out with new genes, but the pathogen <coughs> evolved and was able to overcome these resistance genes and cause an epidemic. Now, since in the 1960s, we've had a number of varieties with resistance genes that have been very effective, and we don't have stem rust epidemics in the United States anymore. So why are we even working on it? <laughs> um, the reason why is because of UG99. And so this is, uh, these are some pictures from Kenya, and you can see the, the stem rust infection on the stems, um, lodging of the, the wheat crop resulting from severe infection, and then um, a really severely infected field. And this has really caused concern because this, this type of um, stem rust in Kenya is very virulent to the wheat varieties that we grow in the United States. So really, what is UG99? It's an isolate. It was first identified in Uganda in 1998, and it was isolated in 1999, hence the name UG99. And it's a race complex of the fungal pathogen, Puccinia graminis, and it's causing stem rust epidemics in East Africa. And so um, it's really important to understand what, what this race complex term means. And so we have to go into um, explaining that. And so to do that, it's necessary to show the seedling infection types. And so this is a scale of wheat um, seedling leaves that have been inoculated with Puccinia graminis, and so you can see that there are a range of different infection types that you can observe. Some of them over here we classify as resistant, but then the ones where there's a lot of sporulation we classify as susceptible. So these are high infection types and these are low infection types. To, in order to classify a race, what we do is we take a sample of Puccinia graminis and inoculate the stem rust differentials. And so these wheat lines here each have a different stem rust resistance gene. Now when you take something like um, an isolate of stem rust from Kenya and you inoculate this differential set, you can get a response that looks like this, where most of these genes are not effective, but there, there are a few, like SR36, that are effective. And we use this, this reaction across these different resistance genes to classify the race. And so this is actually how we get the, the race name TTKS. And so here we have a low reaction and then a high, a high, and a high. So that low, high, high, high corresponds to a K. And so I'm gonna be talking about TTKSK and some other races and it all comes back to the reaction on these stem rust resistance genes. And I think one easy thing that you can take away from this is if there's a T, that's bad. So the more T's, uh, the worse um, the isolate. Now UG99 has been particularly bad because it's been changing over time. So starting off, um, you know, SR36 was actually effective, but then there was a, a new isolate of UG99 that actually overcame SR36. And similarly, there's isolates of UG99 that overcome TTKST. And so that's why it's a race complex. It's not just one race, it's multiple races that are causing this epidemic. UG99 has spread throughout Eastern Africa. So this is just a map showing in 2005 where race TTKSK was present and a similar TTKSF race in South Africa. And over time, the race complex has spread throughout Eastern Africa and into the Middle East. And you can see here that not only is it spreading geographically, but the virulence is spreading. And so you have um, a diversity of races in the race complex that are knocking out additional resistance genes. And so uh, the most recent you know, published map here um, shows you know, throughout all of East Africa, um, there are many places where UG99 is found. UG99 is also a threat to wheat production. 
And so if we go back to the United States, um, this is a, a different heat map showing where wheat is grown and the proportion of the wheat varieties in that area that are resistant or susceptible to the different races of UG99. And so you can see right away there's a lot of red that is susceptibility to race TTKSK. And these, the orange and yellow are um, varieties that are susceptible to other UG99 variants, and then the green are the resistant um, varieties. So what this really means is that if UG99 were to arrive in the US, it would encounter a susceptible crop. And we might be in a situation like we were in in the 1930s and 50s where there could be an epidemic of UG99. And so this threat is why the US wheat and barley growers lobbied Congress to have extra money um, to study UG99 and make some progress and actually why I was hired. So that's where I, I come in. And for UG99, there's really two immediate options, fungicides and genetic resistance. Fungicides are very effective, and UG genetic resistance can be very effective, and I'm gonna talk about genetic resistance for the rest of the talk. So that was the, the introduction to UG99 stem rust and wheat, and now I'm gonna talk about the scoreboard um, for 2017, what kind of what's going on right now. And to do that, I'm gonna talk about three different things. So I'm gonna talk about genetic resources, resistance genes and wheat, and I'm gonna talk about two case studies, one from Ethiopia and one from Kenya. So for the genetic resources, I'd like to introduce the, um, the cytogenetics of wheat. So common wheat is actually an allohexaploid, so there are a number of chromosomes, 42, and these chromosomes were actually derived from the merger of three different diploid species. And so um, sometimes we can go back to these species to um, find additional resistance genes or um, characterize you know, new, new resistance. And so when you break out you know, these chromosomes, they, there are three different groups you know, from the three different species, and there's one through seven, and then the A, B, and D genomes. Now in 2007 or 2008, this is kind of the update for genetic resources for resistance to UG99 in wheat. And so there were about 20 stem rust <laughs> resistance genes that were effective and described, which is pretty good. You can see there are red ones listed here, like SR1A, 1R, and then SR35 is in black. And so the red genes are on alien translocations. So they're um, resistance genes transferred from different species that have been brought into wheat. And oftentimes when you do that, you get what is denoted here by an X, where there could be linkage drag associated with that resistance gene because it's on a big chunk of a chromosome from a, like a really wild species that probably wouldn't be useful for wheat breeding. <clears throat> Another thing to note is that there is this one blue gene here, SR2, and this is an adult plant resistance gene. So most of the genes are effective at all stages in wheat, but this gene is only effective at the adult plant stage. And you know, briefly, this type of resistance at the adult plant stage um, has been thought to be more durable and less likely to break down. And then uh, you can see here there are a number of genes that have markers. So if there are molecular markers available, then this, those can be used to help facilitate the breeding. So that's the situation in 2008. Um, over the past nine years, there's been a lot of progress. So here's 2017. So there were about 20. Now there's about 42 or more resistance genes. You see that there's a whole bunch with molecular markers available. There are now several, about seven, that have been cloned and published. Um, there's also, we had before just one in blue. Now there are several that are in blue. Um, so there are several adult plant resistance loci described. And so, um, you know, that's really good. We have a whole bunch of new genes. I wanna, I wanna quickly run through an example of what, what it really means to, to find a new gene. And so to do that, I'm gonna introduce um, this one up here that we call SR8155B1. And so this is a resistance gene 
that is in this line of wheat called 8155B1. And it's really interesting because it's actually susceptible to the original TTKSK race of UG99, but it's resistant to the new TTKST race. And so this work is a result of a, a big collaboration. And Nirmala was able to map uh, the resistance gene onto a specific chromosome arm and find markers that co-segregated with the gene. And you know, that, that's, that's great and all, we have a new gene. It's effective to some of the UG99 races. What's really interesting about this one is that, as it turns out, it appears to actually be already present in many of the Durham cultivars in, in the United States. And so here are a number of US Durham cultivars. And then here are the postulations for a couple of resistance genes. And these postulations were made based off of this, the reactions that we observe on these two UG99 isolates. Now the 8155B1 gene is associated with this zero fleck type of resistance to raise TTKST, but not TTKSK. And so you can actually see the majority of the US Durham lines that we tested had um, this phenotype, and they also had the, the linked marker for this gene. Now it's still a little bit of a stretch in my mind to make the jump that this line here, which is actually an Ethiopian land race, that this gene might actually be in US Durham wheats. So what we did is we were able to go to a biparental population that was already available, that was a cross between uh, Mount Trail, which is a US Durham wheat, and Chateau. And we phenotyped the population with race TTKST and then mapped the resistance to the same place in chromosome arm 6AS. So it shows that this gene likely is um, the one that is in the US Durham weeds. And so this is the type of work that goes into all of these genes on this chart. And, and really, over the past number of years, this is really what our group has done. And so these red circles are all genes that our lab has contributed to. Many of the genes, um, are ones that we led the project, like SR9H and SR28. We led the molecular side and the phenotypic side. And many of the other genes were led by collaborators, like SR42, led by Jim Anderson. And then we would do the, the phenotyping for those genes. So that's really been a big component of my lab over the past several years in collaboration with many others, especially those at the CDL, like Pablo and Eugen. And so the, the take home point is that on the genetic resistance side, there's a whole bunch of genes. <laughs> We're in pretty good shape. So 2017 for genetic resources, you know, things are going pretty good. So let's jump into one of the case studies. So you've probably seen Pablo present this picture from Ethiopia before. And this is a picture of digaloo wheat growing in Ethiopia. And part of the field has been sprayed with the fungicide. Part has not been sprayed. The part that was not sprayed is severely infected with stem rust with dramatically reduced yields. And uh, this variety accounted for about 50% of the wheat acreage in Ethiopia 2013 to 2014. And so what, what, what's going on here? Um, the really bad thing going on here is that this variety was actually selected because it was resistant to UG99. So it was resistant to UG99, it was grown all over Ethiopia, and then all of a sudden there's a stem rust epidemic. And so samples came to the serial disease lab, and then Pablo um, isolated those samples. And what he found is that um, that epidemic was caused by a new race called TKTTF that's actually not genetically related to UG99. So that's really bad. Um, Digaloo has this, this gene, SRTMP, and it was put out there, but TMP broke down, not even to UG99, but to another stem rust race. So um, it kind of brings home the point that you don't want to have a, a single resistance gene protecting your variety. So another case study is from Kenya, and there's a similar situation in Kenya in 2014 where um, between 2011 and 2014, um, about 67 percent of the wheat seed sold in Kenya was just of this one variety, Kenya Robin. So it's definitely a, a pretty important variety for Kenya. What happened is that um, there was a lot of stem rust observed on this variety. Samples came to the CDL. Maria and Pablo confirmed 
that those samples were a race TTKTT, which is actually a new race of UG99 that breaks down this SRTMP. So again, this single resistance gene that was deployed in Kenya broke down, um, and this time it's in the UG99 lineage. So you can see we're really running out of non-T letters. <laughs> That's really um, a bad thing. So, you know, what does that mean um, for the United States? If we go back to our, our graph here, you can see that we do have this sliver of, of green um, resistant lines, but to the new race TKTT in, in context, what does, uh, where are we at? Um, that's kind of shown in, in this table. You can see a number of different um, germplasm groups shown here, the total of number of lines that were tested. And then this is the number of those lines that were resistant to TTKSK and TTKST. And so you can see that um, you know, various germplasms did have um, resistance. If you add in the race TTKTT, you can see that that number is dropping down quite a bit. And the most significantly so for the US spring wheat breeding lines, you can see we had 34 out of 107 that were resistant, and then we're down to three. And so again, this U.S. spring wheat growing area is historically the most sensitive to a stem rust epidemic. So this is a really um, bad sign that we're kind of back to where we started, you know, nine years ago with resistance that's actually in varieties that farmers might actually grow in the U.S. So the the scoreboard update is kind of a mixed. Um, a mixed message. On the genetic resources side, everything's great. We have a ton of genes. We have a bunch of molecular markers. But in the field, in Ethiopia and Kenya, things aren't so good. The pathogen is actually you know, beating, um, beating the breeders and the pathologists that are trying to, to stop it. So let's get into kind of maybe some things that we can do differently going forward. And in this section, I'm going to talk about um, strategies for 2017 and beyond, and um, I think the best way to kind of describe this next section is if, if this room is like my lab and you were in it, what we're going to kind of do is go to the middle <laughs> and then just kind of like look around. <laughs> and then you'll kind of get a, a, a broad understanding of everything that's, that's there, and we're not going to go into a lot of detail into any one specific thing, but um, I think we'll get, we'll get a few ideas. And so there's really four um, sections I'm going to go through um, for this. So appropriate phenotyping, major gene linkage blocks, transgenic cassette, and then knockout susceptibility genes. And so these are four sort of you know, newer strategies that we can be doing differently. And um, we'll, you know, in the context especially of our lab, but obviously we're working with a lot of other people. So first, with appropriate phenotyping. That epidemic in Ethiopia um, really brought home the point that we can't just be focused on UG99. We have to look at these other races that are out there. And so what this picture shows is a number of different wheat plants that have been inoculated with um, actually four different isolates of stem rust in Ethiopia. And so uh, what we really needed to do is to isolate and increase these different races in Ethiopia and then do testing to more than just UG99 in Ethiopia. So um, a lot of us, Maria, myself, Pablo, Sam Gale, were in Ethiopia. Almost, you know, one of us was probably there over like four or five months or something like that, a long period of time. And what we're able to do is we set up five new screening nurseries in two different locations. Here's just a picture of you know, picking out some locations at a, a field station where we can do some screening. And at Kalumsa, you can see here one of these smaller nurseries. And what we're doing here is actually testing to a specific isolate of stem rust. And so, and here's another field at that same station. And what that allows us is to look at the reaction of important breeding lines to not just UG99, but the other races. And then we'll be able to know, you know, not just in a bulk mixed nursery, but separately what their response is. So the data that we're able to get um, from this type of screening um, looks kind of like this. So over here you have, you know, different wheat lines, and then two years, 2014 and 2015, and then on this axis you have coefficient of infection, which is basically like stem rust infection from low to high. 
And so you can see, you know, lines up here are more susceptible across the board to the three different races. Um, and then lines down here are more resistant across the board to the three different races. What's interesting about this selection of lines is that all of these except Digaloo are susceptible at the seedling stage um, to these three races. And so what we're actually looking at here, if we see any resistance, it's adult plant resistance. And working with Aaron Rendall in the statistics department, we're able to use these data and show that for like our check, Digaloo, where we expect to see a, a race-specific effect, we do see significantly different reaction to race TKTTF than the other races you know, across both years. But interestingly, for our coefficient of infection data, there are three lines where we actually see um, a lower level of infection for race TTKSK than the others. And so, you know, you can look at that and be like, well, that's great, but I don't really trust you, Matt and Paolo. You know, I really want to see more quantitative data. And so um, we actually were able to work with our collaborators there, and they harvested all the plots and measured uh, 1,000 grain weight. And you can see here with these black stars the, the lines where there was actually um, a significant difference in 1,000 kernel weight across the different races for the two years. So. Generally, in three of our four cases, the, the phenotypic um, results were confirmed, and there were actually a number of other lines that the 1,000 kernel weight data provided um, more resolution. So this is interesting because it's showing that even for adult plant resistance, we can see differences in the level of infection in Ethiopia. And the most important thing coming out of this work is that there's this line Kingbird, that showed really strong resistance to these races. And this was actually released as a variety in Ethiopia in 2015. And since then, an additional three varieties have been released in Ethiopia. All of them are resistant to um, these races and um, the other race that we're testing in the field um, in Ethiopia. So this, this appropriate phenotyping is really allowing them to select for not just resistance to UG99, but the other races that are there as well. Similar to what's going on in Ethiopia, we've been doing um, a similar type of screening in Rosemont. And so here's just a, a Google image of the Rosemont field station, and then showing um, different sites where we had a stem rest nursery, and then the race that was inoculated at that nursery and then the year. And so what we're doing is we're looking at um, different races of North American isolates of the stem rust pathogen and testing um, wheat lines here in Minnesota to see if we see any differences across these races. And so we kept, um, in any given year, the, the fields were at least half a kilometer apart. And the fields were, you know, pretty big. <laughs> and I think last year we had 13,000 lines total in these nurseries. And um, spray inoculated three times per field. The workers did not visit more than the same field every day. What we did is we were able to collect data twice and then feed this into our GWAS and biparental mapping populations. And so I want to show a couple of those results. And so this kind of more appropriate phenotyping is allowing us to kind of tease apart the stem rest resistance. And I'm just showing here some work that Arena in our group has done. And it's a Venn diagram showing um, the, the regions in the wheat genome, the number of, wheat, of regions in the wheat genome that are associated with um, reduced severity to a specific race. The main point is there are a lot of different regions that are associated with resistance, but they're all pretty much different and unique to each race. <laughs> and so this really highlights the race specificity that's abundant in North American spring wheat. And so we're, it, we're, what's interesting to us is going to be to compare you know, these data to similar data for the same panel that we have um, data for from Africa. And so also you're looking at a biparental population in this, in this system, we're able to test a hypothesis again about the effectiveness of adult plant resistance. And so in this chart, you can see um, the four races here, and then the percent reduction in stem rest infection. And so what is, what is being measured here 
is the group of lines in the population with all three QTL versus the group of lines with no QTL. And so when you see a big difference, that means that the lines with the three QTL were very different. Now you see that there, there always is um, a level of difference, but that level of difference is very different for each race. And that pattern was observed across um, the three years that are shown here. And so these data suggest that the effectiveness of this particular three QTL combination of adult plant resistance is actually specific to the race being tested. The last piece of phenotyping um, I want to I want to explain really quick is this massive work that we've been doing over the past couple years. And so what's shown here are the reaction of 125 stem rust isolates against 40 um, stem rust resistance gene. And so this matrix um, is really, it's, it's a lot of data. And the point here is to, to show that once, you know, Les and Edward can finish genotyping um, these stem rust isolates, you might be able to do associations of um, the stem rust isolates and their avirulence virulence patterns. And similar to this panel, we've also taken those same stem rust isolates and phenotype them on a diversity panel of about 400 wheat lines. And so just to kind of give you the context of this data, oftentimes if you see like a stem rust association mapping manuscript, you might have like this much data. <laughs> and so this is like a, a, a massive amount of <laughs> data for um, the community. And what we're really trying to go after are the patterns. And so you can see that there are uh, patterns where we can pick apart um, the presence of different stem rust resistance genes and actually do association mapping both ways on the stem rust and on, on the pathogen. And so that, that work is continuing. So there's all this you know, new types of phenotyping um, that we're doing. And then the second part of, these, of this new strategy um, section are major gene linkage blocks. And so Going back to our, our slide of the available stem rust resistance genes, usually these genes are actually present alone. So a wheat cultivar might actually just have one or none of these resistance genes. What we're talking about here is using two or more that are linked together on the same chromosome arm. And so if they're actually linked together in coupling, then you could select for all of them at once in wheat breeding and actually have reasonable population sizes for your breeding. And so a few years ago, we were able to combine a couple stem rust resistance genes on chromosome arm 2BL and release a genetic stock that had both of those resistance genes. And right now I'm going to talk about another linkage block that we're working on. Uh, this one has to do with chromosome arm 1RS. And so this 1RS is actually a chromosome arm from rye that's been transferred to wheat. This line, Pavona RS, has this chromosome arm from rye, but it's only effective to the TRTTF race, but susceptible to TTKSK. And this wheat variety, Nakoda, has a different one RS, and this one's resistant to TTKSK, but susceptible to TRTTF. So what we wanted to do is actually take a genetic stock of um, one RS that's on the 1AL translocation and make a population to see if we can get recombination in between these two genes with the goal of seeing if we can actually pyramid both on one RS. We don't really know if it's possible. Maybe they're the same, maybe they're alleles of the same gene. You know, so the goal of the study is to see if we can even do it. And so this data here shows three lines from the population. These three are susceptible to both races. <laughs> and when you look at the, the molecular genotype of these um, lines, here um, on 1RS, you can see that they have uh, the Pavone markers on the distal side of 1RS and then the Nakoda markers on the proximal side of 1RS. And they have all a similar translocation breakpoint and we're able to separate SR 1RS Amigo from SR31. And so using that knowledge, we can go in to our population and pick out the lines that we think have both resistance genes. So this is kind of nice because we can get a block of 1RS that has both resistance genes 
and then potentially use that in agriculture, and they will always stay together because they're on the same alien translocation. Unfortunately, 1RS has the Secalin locus, which is really deleterious for wheat quality. And so this is where Sean, in his research, comes in. And so Sean has been designing reagents of, um, for the CRISPR-Cas9 system to actually knock out um, the Secalin locus. And so his reagents here are targeting a whole bunch of different sites in this large Secalin region. And you, know, you can talk directly with Sean about his progress. I think he has promising results in protoplasts. Um, but anyways, I think th the main point is we're trying to get this new, um, this linkage block, and hopefully we can knock out the Secalin so that it can actually be used um, in high quality wheat growing regions. The third piece of a new strategy is the transgenic um, cassette strategy. And so this is work that it's being led mostly by others. And so um, if you really want to know a lot more about transgenic cassettes, you know, the best people to talk to in our department are Peter Dodds and Brian Stephenson and others. But I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this. I think it's a great strategy. What it is, is you, is you take the idea is that you would take these genes that we actually have the sequences for, and then you transform them together into a genetically modified wheat that has the clones of multiple stem rust resistance genes that are all together. And then you have um, you know, a gene cassette for multiple resistance genes that hopefully won't break down. That's the idea. And with some advances in wheat resistance gene cloning, this is becoming more feasible. And so this is an outline of this mute ren -seq, um, system where basically, which is first shown in potatoes and tomatoes, I guess. So you, you mutagenize your, your wheat plant that's resistant, you select out susceptible wheat plants, and then you enrich, you extract the DNA and enrich your DNA for the NBS LRR resistance genes. And then you wash off those resistance gene and then go through a sequencing pipeline and call um, hopefully which, which um, NBS LRR genes are mutated in your different susceptible mutants. So this pipeline was successful in cloning a couple of stem rust resistance genes a year ago. And in our lab, Nirmala has been working on this. And you can see she's working with this GABO56 line that has SR9H. And here's a, a susceptible control. And these lines here are all GABO56 derivatives that have been mutated with a chemical EMS and become susceptible. And we, we check the DNA on our 90K SNP array to make sure they are actually in the GABO56 background. Isolated DNA, went through the RENSEQ pipeline. And this is the type of data that you get out of this. You can see up here the number of reads that are aligning to this specific MBS LRR gene. And this is for the GABO56 um, DNA. And then down below are eight different mutants. And so this is one NBLRR candidate where there is a missense or nos nonsense mutation in seven of the eight different um, mutants. And so this is very strong evidence that this MBS LRR um, sequence is the SR9H resistance gene. And so Nirmala is following up um, to confirm this. And you know, the nice thing about working with something that you've already mapped is that you can go to Chinese Spring and then you see that, okay, yeah, this gene also is mapping in the same place. So there's very strong evidence that this is indeed the, the SR9H gene. So the point is that cloning stem rust resistance genes is getting easier. It's still not trivial. And for SR9H in particular, it's actually not that useful of a gene because it's, it is effective to UG99, but not very much else. And we're interested in 9H because of the H, because there's like six other SR9 alleles. And if we can clone one of them, it might be easier to clone the others. And then we can really understand the diversity at this locus. But in the whole transgenic cassette theme, I wanna also bring up another project that Arena has been working on, where he has a biparental population of Agelops umbellulata. And so Pablo made this population where a resistant and susceptible accession were crossed together and the idea here is to go in and find the resistance gene, eventually clone it for use in a future transgenic cassette. 
a lot of the cassettes that are kind of immediately being worked on are for resistance genes that are already in agriculture, which is better than nothing, but we really want genes that haven't been put out into agriculture yet. And so that's why we're working on um, even more resistance genes. And so you can see what Arena did is he used genotyping by sequencing um, to identify um, the region in H. lepsum bellulata where the resistance gene maps. So there is a, a third um, section about new strategies, and it's, it's about um, Jordan's research of knocking out susceptibility. And because of time, I'm actually just going to skip over that. And I hope you can talk to Jordan or myself more um, about that if you want to know more about it. And so those are some of the new strategies that we've been working on in our lab. I um, hope that gives you kind of a, an idea. And um, the take-home messages I like to leave you like to leave you with are just a couple. The first one is that deploying single genes is a waste of resources. I think this is pretty much just true for the wheat stem rust pathosystem. And I'm going to come back to the, the chess game analogy where you know, deploying a single resistance gene is kind of like using one piece in a chess game. You know, maybe it's a really good piece, maybe it's your queen or your king or whatever, but it's still not going to win. <laughs> you know, you're really going to need a strategy with multiple genes. And the other take home message I want to leave you with is that we're out, we are working on new strategies and the community as a whole are trying new things and I hope we'll be able to um, really have victory over this uh, patho system. So there are many people I'd like to acknowledge. Um, Sam Stockson, Sam, can you raise your hand? <laughs> if you don't know Sam, that's who he is. Um, he's kind of the, late, the main technician in, in my group um, who really is excellent and has um, done a lot of the work. Um, Nirmala, Jordan, and Arena, and Sean have all done quite a bit. So Arena and Sean, you guys are both here, raise your hands. Arena, Sean, it's not here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Chandra right here. <laughs> Thanks. And so Kelly Sidla recently moved on um, to work at for the Fairview Hospital in the cytogenetics lab, and she was working a lot of, on a lot of the that big matrix of data. Um, Sammy, can you raise your hand? Sammy has kind of been working on a lot of the markers in our lab, and has really been a great worker and is making helping us to make a lot more progress. Luis, is Luis here? No. Luis is a visiting student, um, actually advised by Julio, who's been working in our lab and hosted by the University of Minnesota. Zach, not here, is an undergrad in our lab. Zena has also been working on a mapping project in our lab. We have a, a lot of collaborators. Most, you know, some of the key ones for this presentation are listed here um, at the CDL, Sharyar, Eugene, Les, and Pablo, who's really with the U of M. And then collaborators at Kenya, Ethiopia, and Simit. Um, collaborators on the Rensik work, um, Jesse Pullen and Edward Akinov at Kansas State, Jim Curley, Brian Stephenson, Jim Berdine, and Jim Anderson at the university. Our funding is really from three different sources in um, multiple projects. We have USDA funding, Gates funding, and then USAID funding. And I'd like to leave you with. I couldn't resist, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to take any questions you might have. Carrot, <laughs> real quick. Oh, when you race type them, since you're finding new genes, are you going to add like another T, or like to move from five letters to six letters or seven letters? And you find new ones? Yeah, so Eugene's kind of the, the authority on that, and so I, I think he's been thinking about it. So, and I think Pablo and I have different ideas about what genes should be in the, the next set. <laughs> so, so we'll see. There might be a new set because we're, run, we're running out. It's going to be T, 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 T pretty soon. So, yeah. Melania? Yeah, I'm wondering about the collection of the 125, yeah, 25 PDT isolates yep. that we're using for that screen. What, what, what's the scope of those that collection and how they were chosen? Yeah, they're, they're pretty diverse. Um, so a lot of them are from the 1970s, 1980s international collection that Julio was working on when he was a PhD student here. And then a lot of them are from 
the sexual populations in Washington, and then a lot of kind of normal isolates that we work with. So we, we try to be as diverse as we could. So you're not including isolates from Ethiopia and... Yep, there are a number of newer African isolates there too. So basically, um, is, is you, could, you could talk to Les about the details, but we try to be as diverse as possible. And within it, we try to answer different questions. So there's like a subset of like 40 that are you know, from the sexual population to see if we can get some linkage disequilibrium to actually get association mapping to work. <laughs> and then there's like a subset where there are, we think they're clonal lineages like TPMK, TMLK, you know, it's like different variations of the same lineage. So they're, they're kind of, it's structured multi-dimensionally to answer different questions. And we try to be as diverse as we could. Uh, two questions, very diverse. First one, the resistance genes that you see are cloned. I'm, I'm not familiar with the work. It's great that you uh, Are all of them NBSL, traditional NBSL or R type genes, or are there any that have a different molecular mechanism? Yeah. Five of them are NBSLRRs. The two exceptions are these two. Uh, SR57 is an ABC transporter, and SR55 is a hexose transporter. And so there's not too much known about these. Melania is the one to really ask <laughs> more about what these actually do, and I think she's working on trying to figure that out. Um, but most of them are uh, traditional NBS LRRs with a couple of exceptions. And a very different note, um, I see, I hear you talking about genetically modified meat, that's not a very... Have you been, in, have you been at uh, meetings and discussions where people thought about uh, the implications or the acceptance of that, if, if you succeed? Yeah, not much. I think everything I've heard is that, well, it's not permitted, <laughs> and it's kind of a, it's kind of a no-go until things change. And so the whole transgenic cassette strategy is definitely, there's definitely a big barrier there. In, in order like, to protect all these new genes and not be using alone and break away new races, do you know if there are like, conversations between like, different breeding programs around the world to say, okay, let's protect this one, don't use it alone, or it's like each program will use, okay, I'm going to take something too and use it and see what's going on. I don't really have a good way to answer that question because. There, there isn't a, a governing authority over breeding programs, right? And so it's really up to what the breeders want to do. And um, so, and then across, across the globe, it's even you know, more complicated because you know, there's simit germplasm, and that's really one breeding program that's going to a lot of different places that really counts for most of the, the varieties. And so if you talk about for some of these developed countries, it, it's really one breeding program with you know, maybe some, um, the national breeding program is trying to get going. So yeah, I mean, maybe for some countries, it's really just what CIMIT is doing is, you know, if CIMIT can kind of get a good strategy, I think we'd be in pretty good shape. And, and they're definitely leaning towards the APR, but as you know, you know, we get their lines and there's definitely a lot of seedling genes there, so. I don't have a good answer. We need to talk more, but it's difficult because you know, breeders can do whatever they want to do. Um, so for that resistant cultivar king bird, uh, are the resistant genes in that cultivar identified like single gene or multiple genes or is it not? Well, um, we know that it has adult plant resistance, so it's seedling susceptible. There was a, a paper that published the QTL mapping and found something like four or five QTL that were associated with the resistance. So it kind of fits the model of this multi-genic you know, adult plant resistance. And then in, in follow-up studies, um, other labs have confirmed many of those QTL in different mapping populations. So I think there's pretty good evidence that it is indeed you know, several different adult plant resistance low side. 